Welcome to a World of Good podcast. I'm Nate Tapman. And I'm Andrew Gale. And we are two friends who love Jesus, care about the church, and travel the world to share stories of people who do the same. Our conversations happen in all kinds of places. Like a coffee shop in an airport terminal. Or even the back of a crowded taxi. But no matter where we go, from Argentina to Zimbabwe, we capture stories of the good God is doing around the world. And we hope those stories will do you a world of good. Welcome to a World of Good podcast. My name is Andrew Gale. I am so grateful to get to be here just outside of Allen, South Dakota. Is this considered Allen where we are now? Martin. Martin. Okay. So we're in Martin, South Dakota, visiting good friends, Tim and Kim Mordell. I got to travel here with my good friend, Josh Weger from... Yeah, Josh is here. He did not want to be a part of this recording. So he is sitting in a separate space so that he's far enough away that I can't reach him with a mic. If I could, I would make him say something, but since I can't, and I'm not getting up because I'm eating some really delicious potato soup, I'm, I'm stuck where I am. Grateful that we're finally able to be here with you guys, Tim and Kim. I think this is like the fourth time we've tried to plan this trip. The last time we planned it, Josh and I drove to the airport in a snowstorm because our flights got moved back a day. It took us twice as long to get to the airport. And then the flight, we got on the flight, boarded. We thought, oh my gosh, this is going to happen. And then there were mechanical issues and they canceled our flight. And it's it has felt like, I mean, I travel all over the world and it has felt like it has been more complicated to get four states over <laughs> than it is to go across the world sometimes. Yep. But there's only one flight. I mean, for what, what we fly, we fly Delta. There's only one flight out of Minneapolis that goes into rapid. I mean, you have to fly to Minneapolis and you got to get on one of two flights a day to get in. So when I thought of a rural community, my imagination of a rural community has been expanded to really think about rural in all of its ruralness, as hard as that is to say. But we're grateful to be here, grateful to be able to sit down with you guys, grateful to be at church tomorrow. So thanks so much for welcoming us into your space. You're welcome. Welcome. <laughs> so to get, for those that don't know who you guys are, give us a little bit of context. The church that you guys serve is Pass Creek Church in Allen, South Dakota. Right. So tell us a little bit about Allen. Tell us about Pass Creek Church. Well, the Pass Creek Church has been in existence for... 35, 40 plus years, a real small gathering. Typically, it's just about a half a mile south of the village of Allen. The population of Allen is roughly 600, 650, 64 homes, and then those people pack into those homes. Again, about a half a mile from the church. And um, when we began in uh, September 2016, Roughly six to eight people would show up on Sunday mornings. After about eight months or so, we were building it, and we were up to about 35, 40 adults, wow. 40 children, and then COVID hit. Yeah. And so things haven't been the same. Absolutely, and that's true across the world. One of the things I was so surprised by, I mean, I've heard you talk about Alan. I'm sure you told me before the population, 600, 64 homes. So it's a small village, very small community. What I did not realize is that when we left the airport at Rapid City and we drove for two hours to Allen, that we would probably not pass, another, we would not pass 64 total homes from Rapid City to Allen. Uh, th that was just really mind boggling to me. Like I expected to see little villages here and there the whole way, but you are really out, I mean, out away from, from there are other villages here, but I mean, Allen is, it's, you're a long ways from, a place like Rapid City, if you want to go to a Walmart. I mean, you're very rural when you think about rural. Yes, we are. We're tucked away in the southwest corner yeah. of South Dakota, the reservation. And you like that? Love it. <laughs> Our idea of a traffic jam is a John Deere tractor doing 10 miles an hour down <laughs> right. the road. So. <laughs> so tell us about Allen. This is a, is Allen technically on the reservation? Yes. Or, okay. Yes. So you're a half mile, but you, the church is technically not on reservation land or it is. It is. It is on private deeded land Okay, within reservation yep. boundaries. Yeah, gotcha. Awesome. How did you guys get connected with Alan? Our home church in Georgia, the pastor there grew up in South Dakota, and his home church had done missions on the reservation all through his childhood. So it was something he had a heart for. And he brought that heart to the church in Georgia and encouraged them to be part of doing missions on the reservation here. So it was a continuation of the legacy from his childhood. That's incredible. So you started 
doing the short term thing, then coming out here kind of as a part of that church congregation. So that's correct. We got started as short term mission trip members. That's awesome. I think that's so important for churches to hear because I think sometimes we we assume that, you know, long term people are people that have always dreamed about doing this. But I think a lot of times people experience something and go, wow. I feel called here. I feel like this is what I'm, what, what I should be doing. And so what was that? How many times had you been out here before you kind of decided, man, we're going to jump in full force and, and make this happen? I had been on six or seven summer mission trips. And then Tim and I together had been on one before we felt like this was, it was the time for us to come full time. I, we really believe because we started out as short-term mission visitors we really believe in the power of the impact of, we call them short-term engagement missions. And so we really believe in that. It's a big part of the ministry that we do here is partnering with others to reach yeah. the lost. And that partnership involves churches who help us staff out some special events in the summer we couldn't do with just our, our limited staff. But we also believe that that gives back to the churches. So yeah. we see ourselves as part of every church's discipleship program. Absolutely. Where we give their people an opportunity to grow, work, stretch, be uncomfortable <laughs> so they can go back and do the same work in their church. Our, our line with the churches, the teams always is you're here for one week of the year, but God has you there for 51 weeks of the year. Absolutely. And he wants you doing the same thing there yeah. that you did here. That connection back is so important because it's easy for us to see this as this one-off where you're going and, oh, I get to be a Christian that does this kind of work this one week. And then I've done my, I checked that off for the year rather than seeing this as you said, discipleship as a part of our our whole life as a Christian is walking with people, walking with people that we're around, whether that means for the one week that we're here in South Dakota or for the 51 weeks that we're back at our home, how do we walk with people that God's brought into our presence? So you've been here for how long? You started in what year? We arrived here full time in September of 2016. Okay. And we partnered with the existing ministry leaders for a year to okay. make for a smooth transition for the people that we serve. Absolutely. Any kind of abrupt change is really hard for the Lakota people because they've had so much loss. Yeah. Um, and so we didn't want them to feel like anyone was being replaced. We didn't want them to feel abandoned. Yeah. And so we really partnered that first year with ministry leaders who were retiring so that our people were comfortable feeling that we were stepping in and continuing yeah. the ministry. Well, I've heard you guys say that, you know, historically there's a feeling, a sense that people come and go, that people don't stay. I mean, even I think I've heard you say that your first year, a couple of years, people were asking, when are you going to, when are you going to leave? Like eventually you're going to, we know eventually you're going to leave almost that assumption, which I, it's really sad. I mean, that's a, a terrible, I mean, but even more of a reason why long-term consistency is really important in this kind of a role. And it makes sense when you think about, you know, you've shared the four kind of areas of ministry focus that you have. The first one being a ministry of presence. I mean, it makes sense why that is so vitally important because there are people who have experienced loss, who have experienced people leaving, experienced saying goodbyes. Can you talk to us about those four areas of ministry and, and what those are and kind of, you know, why those are the four areas that you've kind of landed on? So if we were to encapsulate our vision statement for the ministry here, it would be those four areas. As you said, a ministry of presence, helping without hurting. So this goes back to the principle of stepping away from a charity mentality that creates dependency and instead an empowerment mentality that equips people. Um, and then the third would be building meaningful relationships, not just numbers, not just quantity, but that the relationships that are built are meaningful ones. And then the last is partnering to reach others, remaining with that mentality that this isn't something we're doing all ourselves, that yeah. we're part of the bigger church, part of the bigger family of God, yeah. and bringing that sense of family and partnership to the Lakota people who have a powerful sense of family Absolutely. and belonging. So in this episode, in this podcast, we want to kind of focus on that first area, which is the ministry of presence. And even in the short time that I've been with you, I've seen it firsthand, but also heard stories of what that ministry of presence looks like. And it's been, 
it's such a challenge for me when I hear that, just to process that, to think about that, to not let that, it's easy to hear a ministry of presence. Oh yeah. That just means that you're present with people. Well, but it's a lot more than that. It's a lot more than that. So talk to me when you talk about a ministry of presence, what does that mean for you and for the ministry here in Allen? Well, we as disciples should always, whether you're on a reservation or not, we should always be looking for opportunities we should be looking for Jesus in every corner, in every situation, in every conversation. And, and so when we say ministry of presence, we don't just mean making ourselves available. We mean that while we're in that moment, there's nothing distracting us from being the church, being a disciple, doing what Jesus would do, say what Jesus would say, act like Jesus would act. And so it's always making sure that we are in his presence ourselves so that when we do run into a situation like yesterday that you and Josh were able to witness, yeah. you know, that guy was there on the side of the road. And yeah, t- t- tell us about that. I mean, can you, can you yeah. paint a picture of kind of what we experienced? We were, we were driving up, we were getting ready to turn off at Boom Docks, is that what it was called? Right. And getting ready to turn off, and up ahead, you saw someone sitting. We just saw a guy sitting on the side of the road, literally sitting right near the white line. Yeah, like his back would have been if, on the white had, line if it was a wall. Had he passed out and fallen back into the road, somebody would have ran over him. Yep. And this is a major road. I mean, we're not talking yeah. about a, a, this right. is a highway. It's highway, highway 18, yeah. so it's the main artery through this, uh, this area. But he was just sitting there. And so we stopped. And I walked up to him and noticed that he was inebriated. But I I knelt down on a knee and I asked him who he was. And he told me his name and he told me where he was headed. And it it was obvious to me that there was something more than alcohol going on because maybe diabetic. He said, I'm hungry. And we had just come from the pizza shop there in Martin. (laughs) So we, you know, Rob gave me the food and I was able to give him a couple of pieces of pizza and then I noticed that he kind of was coming around. But while, while I was there with him, I didn't want to be preachy, but I just wanted to know where he was and what was going on in his head. And of course, he was too inebriated to really get into a lot of great conversation, meaningful conversation. But in that short time I was with him, I was able to determine that he was dropped off by some friends. One of the guys in the vehicle got mad at him because he wanted them to give them a ride further down the road mm. and they just opened the door and said, get out. And so th- that opportunity is not, when we say ministry of presence, we're not saying that we go up to that guy and we ask him if he died today, does he know whether he's going to heaven <laughs> or hell? <laughs> yeah. But we want, it's not him, a revival and evangelism. It is not yeah. evangelism. It is relationship. It is about being the hands and feet of Jesus and so in that moment, I just wanted him to know that somebody cared. Yeah. That somebody, I didn't. Ha- I don't have to know you to care for you. Yeah. So. And that takes the willingness to let your schedule be shifted, right? I mean, that's that's a big piece because oftentimes the reason I can't be present with someone is because I have somewhere I have to be. Like <laughs> you know, I'm I'm off I'm off on some. So how do you how do you handle that? It's less emphasis on ministry and more emphasis on presence. Mm. Like you can think of a ministry of presence as a whole program that makes you be present with people (laughs) or you can be present with people and as their desire or their seeking or their need emerges, you can then build a program of ministry that might meet that need. Mm. So I didn't come here intending to teach parenting classes. Yeah. But in my interactions with people, especially with the women who maybe had lost their children for a number of different reasons or were court ordered to take parenting classes to get their children back. They mean lost isn't like DCS, that kind of like Mm -hmm. losing to the the state government. Yeah, Correct. That need emerged. And because of that need, then we developed a program where we could provide and meet that need. But it's still more about the presence with the people and the trust that's established that makes what we have to say valuable to them. Yeah, I think that Tim's statement is, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Yeah, And my, my statement on that is, 
I've never changed my mind about anything in my whole life because someone I didn't know told me something. I've only ever <laughs> changed my mind about anything important because I trusted the person who yeah. was telling it to me. Yeah. And so for us, we want to build that kind of relationship with people where they know us and trust us. And we believe that it's in that place ministry happens. Yeah. Would you say that part of that is being willing to be interrupted, like creating space where you are interruptible? Does that make sense? Because part. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually, when we have gone to visit a couple of our supporters and they've asked me to preach, one of the things that I talk about is uh, that I, that I've preached on is this ministry of presence. And in that presentation or that, uh, that message, we give an example two o'clock in the morning, there's a knock on the door and it's cold. Snowbank is 12, 12 feet. There's two or three feet rested with ice and the, the door, the bang on the door, it's two in the morning. I get up begrudgingly. <laughs> I get up with a little bit of an attitude, like don't yeah. they know that it's two in the morning and yeah. that I need to rest. I get up, go to the door, pull the curtain back. And it's one of the locals who drinks a lot. Mm. And he was mumbling. And I, and so I said, it's so-and-so. And I went and got in my clothes and went out the back door and came around. By this time, he's spread eagle down on the face down in the, in the snow, swimming like he's trying to get up. And I finally just said, you know, hey, you got to get up, grab a hold of the, the, the travel trailer that's next there, grab a hold of the seats, pull yourself up and get over here to me. I started the truck and let it start warming up so that I could get him in there. Got him in there. W what do you need? The only thing I got was I need your support. He didn't tell me where to take him or whatever. I couldn't take him back down to his house. The roads were just too treacherous, even in a four-wheel drive. And so he said, take me up to my nieces in the village. I went there. Couldn't get up there either because of the roads. Turned around and there's an officer there. I am extremely agitated. He's not communicating with me. And I feel like my personal time has been invaded. Mm. The officer stops me and, hey, Pastor Tim, what are you doing out here at 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning? I've got so-and-so in the back of the truck. Oh, is he, is he drunk? And I said, well, is the Pope Catholic? Yes, mm. he's... <laughs> said, let me take him. And I'll give him a place to stay tonight and warm and I'll give him breakfast in the morning. Probably a good idea. They put him in the back of the truck and I looked over at him and he was looking out the window. And there was just this look between the two of us. And the sense that I got was that I had failed the Lord mm -hmm. in that moment. What would you have done different? What would you have done different? And this dialogue, this, this conversation is ensuing with me and the spirit. And it's like, I don't know what else I could have done. He wouldn't have understood a word. And you're right. You're right, the spirit says. But your attitude mm. toward it could have been different. Mm. My people who were called by my name cannot afford to be inconvenienced. Yeah. Wow. And we've seen that in our short time here, just how many phone calls and connections are made because people do know that you're here and that you're committed. And so they reach out with questions and concerns. And, and I think that the two stories you've shared are, I'm, I'm sure, quintessential for what you experience on a, a daily, weekly basis here. But I also think it's really important to share that this ministry of presence certainly is done on an individual one-on-one -on -one basis. And that is a huge part of the ministry, but it's, it would be easy, I think, to envision that the ministry of presence is only done on that one-on-one -on -one basis. And a number of stories you've shared with me have been about the communal ministry of presence. And, and the first would be just, you've talked about wakes and, and what it means to be present at a wake. So Tim, can you talk about what is the experience when someone passes away in the village? What is the experience of a wake and a funeral in terms of timeline? And how do you interact with that? So traditionally, it's a three-night wake with a burial on the fourth day. But so three nights. So things are happening during the day, though, too, right? I mean, well, so it's... The, it's a body is at a 
specific location. Family is in and out throughout yeah. the day, staying around, spending the night, sleeping by the body, sleeping with their family. Meals are provided. Meals are provided. And they want both a traditional spiritual leader as well as a Christian officiant. Sure. And I wind up being the <laughs> officiant of these things quite a bit, which yeah. is an opportunity because what happens, the Lakota people honor their deceased relatives far more meaningfully than we do. Mm. We, our people die. We go to the funeral home. We set it up. We do visitation. Yep. The next day they're buried. Yeah, get it done in a couple hours. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we sense that when we buried our son, Caleb, when we took him back home to Georgia, we when, when the service was over, Kim got in the car and she just says, there's something so empty about this. Mm. And the Lakota people value their relative that has passed on. Mm. And so what I got from the, the f folks when we first got here is that the ministers will come in, say a prayer, shake hands, kiss babies and leave. Yeah. They'll and, function like a regular funeral. And they're going to function on yeah. and they're going to have their traditional drummers come in and singers yeah. and people are going to come in and out, out throughout the day. And, but what the Lord impressed upon my heart was that, no, I want you there. I want you to be a ministry of presence. You may not say a word to anybody, but I want them to know that you are there with them, that it is not a part-time gig. You are here. You are in their space. You are engaged in their community. You're immersed in their culture, in their family lives, and you care. For multiple days. For days. And <laughs> for example, we just had one where we buried Lala, the four-year-old. Monday, we were there. I was there six hours Tuesday was another six. Kim was there with me. And then Wednesday was another six and a half, seven. Yeah. And it's, and, and really during those three days, there might've been four or five meaningful conversations. But if I could make a connection here with another part of the ministry, as I was sitting there, I literally got from God, ask the grandma what they need. Mm. And I said, you know how this is going to work. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to ask them what they need. And I've then they're going to ask for this and this and this. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's never going to end. Yeah. So you want me to do this? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we have the funds for that. Right. And I got just this. We clear, have all the reasons. When we, God asks yeah. us to do so, we have all the reasons exactly. not to. <laughs> and so I, I, as I say often, I got taken to the woodshed. And what I got <laughs> was this. When I ask you to do something, don't second guess it. Do you know who I am? Mm. And I'm already at the end of this. I know what's in your account. I know the number of hairs on your head. Yeah. So what I'm looking for is obedience, Tim. And, and you've experienced this before. I've asked you to do things and it didn't make sense, but you did them and look how they worked out. So I said, okay, I give up. I'm going to go. So I sat down by the grandma and I said, grandma, how can we help you? And she said, well, we just made a list. And she opened the list and it was very long <laughs> and of things they needed. And so I just said, okay, Lord, that's what you want. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> you told me to do this. This is what I knew would happen. I get in the truck. I leave the, the area, that, the building. I'm, I'm on the main 18 on the main yep. road going into Martin to buy the food. And my phone rings hmm. and it's Pastor Vondi Cook from Cross Point Church in West Virginia. I haven't spoken to Vondi in two years since mm. since our last convention in, in Denver. Wow. And Vondi said, hey, brother, I just want you to know that, man, we are thinking about y'all. We we just read about this little girl and our ladies got together and we raised some money and we want you to take care of this family. Wow. Now I'm on the way to the store to buy the food and I don't know how much money I have to spend, Yeah, but now I do <laughs> because he said, and we're not, he said, Tim, we're talking several thousand dollars yeah. that they've raised already. Wow. And we want you to use it for this family. And so we were able to go that day and then the following day and buy a few hundred dollars worth of groceries and, and help them. Uh, an organization here on the reservation had committed to provide them with a meal. 
when they thought it was a suicide, but when they discovered that it wasn't, that it was an accident, then they digressed and said, you know, we're not going to have any part of this. So we stepped in, we were able to step in and feed them. And in the process, we go to that partnering to reach the lost. Mm -hmm. And so we build bridges, it's bridges of hope. And the bridges are not on the bridge is not only between a people defined by hopelessness to the God of hope, but it's also a bridge built from church to church, building relationships. And out of that, many churches have made friends all over the country and writing to each other. And, and so it's been significant. That's cool. One of the other things that I've heard you guys do, which I think is somewhat a communal aspect of this ministry of presence is Blue Christmas. And maybe other people do this around the country. I don't know. It was something that I had not heard about before. Um, So Kim, can you tell us a little bit about what Blue Christmas is and the significance behind that for this community? Well, the Lakota's lives are interwoven with continual and perpetual grief. They have generational trauma that creates grief for them. They experience it on a regular basis through the afflictions and addictions that they have. And then they struggle with health issues that also bring about a lot of untimely deaths. So grief is an interwoven piece of their daily life. And when we first came here, there was an older woman, a member, a strong, faithful, God-loving member of our church, Melissa Yellowboy, who came to us that first year at Christmas and said, I do a blue Christmas every year and I hope that can continue with you guys here. And we said, well, yeah, talk to us about it. Tell us what it is. And it's a an opportunity during the holiday season to recognize people who might be struggling with celebrating what should be a happy holiday because they are struggling with the feelings of loss and loneliness due to people that they don't have with them at that holiday. And Melissa had really started it because of the loss of a granddaughter that Mm. that died in a car accident. And so we partnered with Melissa to learn how she did this and how it spoke to the community. And Melissa has since passed on so we have continued that tradition, but we, we have a day, an evening in December when we invite everyone in the community to bring pictures of their loved ones wow. who they don't have with them anymore. We set up the sanctuary with tables. We have candles and blue decorations. We redecorate the Christmas tree only in blue and silver. Mm. And the whole service starts with um, all the lights out and only some dim blue Christmas lights to light the space. We go through a liturgy that focuses on Jesus being the light Mm. in the midst of our grief and loss and loneliness and even anger. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of a grief process too for people. And then we invite people to come up and share about their loved one, tell the story. This is a storytelling culture. And so whenever they come up to share about a loved one that they've lost, we have them light a candle. So the more that people share, the lighter the room gets. And that becomes part of what we talk about that Jesus says, when we share with one another, when we engage with one another and we don't hide in the darkness with our pain or our guilt, that it brings more light. That's beautiful. And then we close with a song and a time of fellowship and the community really looks forward to it. Yeah. And it's a way that people who otherwise might not come into the church because yep. they're traditional or whatever feel welcome and can see the kind of love and care that we want to give yeah. to them. And it gives space for people in that communal way for you to be present with people, for the people to be present with one another and together to say, my light alone is my grief. But when we choose to to be together in our grief and support one another in our grief, we can we can light up an entire room. There's yes. there can be hope in the midst of that difficulty. Yes. And that's really, really cool. And of course, by the time we did our second blue Christmas, we had lost our son here to suicide. Mm. And so I think it was a powerful connection for the community that we stood up and shared our grief. Yep. And we're transparent in the pain of that grief, that we validated all of those emotions that they wrestle with. 
but that we were able to also share that it's because we walk with Jesus that the yeah. pain of that grief is eased. Yeah. You know, one of the things we do on the podcast often is we'll end with this question. And I think it's very appropriate after the fairly heavy conversation we've had. Ministry of Presence is not for the faint of heart. It means stepping into people's worlds and walking with them through and my home church. My pastor would always say it's sitting in the mud with people, you know, being willing to sit in the mud with them. And so it's not always the most just life-giving and, 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 and joyful thing, but yet it's what we're called to. But one of the questions that we ask at the very end, the podcast is called A World of Good. So we say, what is some good that God is doing in your world today? And so as you think about the ministry and what's going on, can you share one story or one piece of where you see God's goodness in your world? For me, I see it in the trust that I believe is being developed between the community and with us. And I see that manifested in the way people trust us with their children. Mm. They believe that we will love on their children, that we will bring positiveness into their children, whether it's the youth or the young kids or the VBS program we do in the summer, parents want their kids here. Yeah. Our playground is the playground that parents bring their kids to because they know they won't be bullied or picked on or hurt. That's and huge. I in the community it, where, there's, where there's concerns and fears, like that's huge to be the safe space. Right. And, and I see it in the trust that we see in the broader community, such as the indigenously led recovery center on the reservation, inviting us in to be part of the program to speak to those people. So to invite me in to teach parenting classes in their recovery center, yeah. to invite Tim in to lead healing circle with the men, to invite us in to be part of their staff almost, to speak into that process. I think that takes a tremendous amount of trust. Absolutely. Well, that's exciting. You know, and I would add, to that, that um, with the adults, Kim Kim brought the uh, children into it, but with the adults, you know, we have, it's taken us a while and we have built relationship with adults and they trust us. And so they invite us into things like their family memorials. Their, there was a dedication recently when they are five years ago, when they did the, redid the road there they invited us down to say a blessing over the new construction of the road. And, and so we get in community prayers. community prayers. We just did one for Lala and two guys reached out to me, a spiritual leader and a, and a tribal political representative said, you know, we need you there. And so it just, we just feel honored that they invite us into their circles and that they trust us and that they know we love them. We, we know that we're here to stay. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, not, we're not going anywhere. Well, Tim and Kim, thank you so much for the ministry that you do, the ways that you engage with this community. It's obvious that you are loved, but it's also obvious that you love this community. And it's been an awesome pleasure to be with you and can't wait to join you at church tomorrow to experience that. But thanks so much for giving us some time for sharing some of your stories. And we look forward to hearing more stories in the future. Awesome. Hopefully. <laughs> thanks for listening to A World of Good. A World of Good is a podcast production of Global Strategy and Church of God Ministries. Our theme song is Colorado by Leo Flores. If you want to join the conversation, Visit us at Twitter at A World of Good Pod, on Instagram, A World of Good Podcast, or visit our website, chaglobal.org slash A World of Good. And join us next time as we share more stories of good from around the world.